just raised the bar with that win. Yeah, no kidding. My bar for that game was just don't let Nick Felino score. Let's go! Give me what I want! Kick down the door! Drew, you are not doing this! What the not nice! There's a giant hit! <laughs> you hear yourself! I made like 2,000 of these. I'd like to have fun. With you, wherever you are, welcome to LFR. No, but actually, do you know a goalie? Eh? Leafs win! 2-1 over the Boston... Mm. You, you'll have to forgive me. Just... Over the Boston Bruins. Oh, it's better, right? It's better than the rest of them. Most of the rest of them. Okay, I'll do it again without interruption. Leafs win! 2-1 over the... Mm, no, no. I, I gotta... Leafs win! 2-1 over the... Boston Bruins. Oh, it's better. It's better. I'm sorry. Well, quite the 24 hours or so in hockey, and we'll unpack all that, but there's a thing I gotta do. Wanna bet? You can do it at Sports Interaction, Canada Sportsbook. Does your team not have any goalies? Well, you can, you can bet for or against them at Sports Interaction during the game, live in play or on one of their many prop bets. Made for Canadians by Canadians, Sports Interaction makes it easy to deposit, play, and cash out. Join now and see all sports betting has to offer. Visit sportsinteraction.com slash sdpn. That's sportsinteraction.com slash sdpn. Ontario only. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. Now, uh, where to begin? Now, there's a lot of things that go into making these videos. It's not all just yelling and screaming. Well, okay, sometimes. Sometimes it's all just yelling and screaming, but a lot of the times it's not. I watch the game, I have my thoughts on it, but then I sit down in front of the camera and a funny thing happens. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard me talk about the first LFR of the season and how I always forget how to do this. Even though my first LFR of this season was actually the 16th first LFR I've ever done. LFR meaning Leafs fan reaction in case you didn't know. But I think, what did I see? What am I trying to say? And then I think more existential stuff like, who am I talking to? Who are you? Yeah, you. I'm talking to you. I'm not dumb. Well, I am. But not when it comes to this. I know that fewer people watch when the Leafs win. But out of the people who are watching, who are you? What are your interests? What do you like? What do you dislike? And who do you cheer for? Am I talking to Leafs fans primarily right now? Or are Bruins fans tuning in for this one? Because in a rare position for a first place team, the Boston Bruins were the main character of the NHL for the last 24 hours, and it wasn't a good thing? So what do we talk about first? Do we talk about the game or that? Tell you what, why don't we talk about the game first, and then we'll talk about that. That being the Mitchell Miller signing, and we'll, we'll briefly touch on it because the Bruins were 10 and one heading into this game. They lost one game out of the first 11. They were first place in the entire National Hockey League and Linus Olmark, their starting goalie for this game, was undefeated. That was his first loss of the season. It is November 5th. How is that possible? Remember how the Bruins didn't have Marchand and still don't have McAvoy? Didn't matter. First place. Yesterday during interviews and game day, the morning of during interviews, the players seemed upset. And the number one question I kept getting asked all day, how are the Bruins players going to respond to all this? Because the players had nothing to do with it. So are they going to crumble under the distraction or are they going to rise to the occasion and really pound the crap out of the Leafs? There were spots in this game where the Bruins didn't exactly look crisp, but I got to say the first 10 minutes belonged to the Leafs. I've talked about on and off over the last few years that the Leafs seem to play games in like 10 minute chunks. It's not uncommon for them to look terrible to start a game and then run the second half of the period and vice versa. First 10 minutes of this game, it seemed like they had the puck more than Boston, more shot attempts, more shots on goal, better opportunity. And just after the halfway point in the first period, when the Bruins started to get traction and started to generate chances and started to have the puck more, Austin Matthews. Austin Matthews with the finish, but more specifically this play was all the Leafs best players doing their part. Namely, the top line and the top pair. And you might be like, top pair? What's that? Is that Brody Hall or is that Riley Lilligren? Well, you might not have noticed, but the D pair that was on the ice for this goal was actually Riley Brody with Brody on the right, like he usually is. Riley gets the entry, dumps it into the corner. Matthews uses his body, his stick, and most importantly, the fact that he's Austin Matthews to draw in two Bruins, 
freeing up the puck for Michael Bunting. He throws it around for TJ Brody at the point, who gives it to Mitch Marner, who rings it around the net. All pretty standard, but tidy stuff so far. Bunting gets into a battle behind the net with Brandon Carlo, who is just straight up a bigger person. Not a bigger person, as in be the bigger person, like he's large. And it's a battle! Carlo goes down, Bunting loses his stick, Austin Matthews is waiting there, Bunting doesn't have a stick though! And even though you're not allowed to kick the puck into the net, you're allowed to kick the puck to the guy who puts it there, and that's what Bunting does! Matthews essentially does a, a practice drill, toot toot! Happens so fast the broadcast camera barely picked it up! Matthews dangling in a phone booth, and the top line gets a very needed 5 on 5 goal. Now you might remember from the last game I was talking about the Flyers needing a MAP! Like I thought the Flyers were incredibly soft in their own end and left Austin Matthews wide open, but at least that was on the power play. Every Bruin on the ice is in this photo and I only see a stickless Michael Bunting and the reigning Hart Trophy winner! WHY ISN'T ANYONE CLOSER?! The only blameless guy there is Carlo, like he fell down- at least he fell down doing his job! What is everyone else doing?! Well they're trying to block off the pass- BLOCK OFF THE PASS CLOSER TO THE 60 GOAL GUY! Well most players can't do that dude- WHAT?! GET HOCKEY DB! Oh I got no voice left. They play tomorrow too, huh? GET HOCKEY DB! Huge selly from Matthews too, and a moment that maybe- Maybe he and the Leafs can ride for the next little while here. Because Matthews is starting to score! Goals are starting to go in for him. But they're gonna go in for him. They need to go in for him at the pace he wants. The silly you're gonna remember from this is him just crouched down like, yeah! like in a turtle shell of victory. There's a camera from the corner and if you pause it at just the right moment, that is a man who just got his swagger back. Just as the Bruins were getting back into the game, one nothing Leafs. That's how the game would go into intermission. The Leafs outshoot the Bruins 11 to 7 and we all have a Merry Christmas. Then on the stream, watch Hockey Night in Canada with Steve Dangle on the Sports Night YouTube channel, I said a dumb thing to start the second. I said, Hey! Did you notice there weren't any penalties in the first? Followed by John Tavares immediately taking a penalty. This was a slash on Jake Zborrell and it did get him right in the fingers and cause him to lose the puck. That's a penalty. Ensuing penalty kill, TJ Brody, he loses a step to Brad Marchand, trips him! Penalty shot! Now I'm sure you've seen the highlights. Um, Marchand scored. He got Ilya Samsonov a pretty bad. I thought about showing you screenshots. Um... I've decided not to because it's gross. Not the move, I mean the move was gross, but more specifically, Ilya Simsonov's knee! I've tried to think of ways to describe what it looked like, but uh, have you ever bent a paperclip? Or like, imagine if a regular W turned itself into a cursive W. None of it looked good and Simsonov took a while to get up, but oh, okay, he got up. I, he's up. I guess he's okay? You're okay. I get- I think he's okay. Unfortunately, it's 1-1, the Bruins tie it, but it, he's okay. He's fine. Well, it sucks, but at least the power play is oh, why is it still the power play? So this was really confusing to me. The Bruins scored on a penalty shot that they got while on the power play. I can't remember the last time that happened. I certainly don't remember the last time it happened to the Leafs, so I didn't have like a frame of reference. So I was really confused why the Bruins still had a power play after this. But it's obvious, if that hadn't been a penalty shot, it would have been a penalty, which would be a five on three. And if the Bruins had scored with the extra attacker, they would still be on the power play. This sort of worked the same way, so double bad. So that kind of adds a layer to the story of this game. Samsonov left at second intermission. This goal happened with 15 minutes left in the second period. He had to kill a penalty after this. Kind of makes the fact that the Leafs won a little bit more bananas, doesn't it? But the Leafs get a little bit of power play luck of their own later in the period. Jake DeBrus goes off for holding TJ Brody and I'm, I'm not gonna lie Bruins fans, if I were you I'd be mad too. Listen, usually I'm complaining about the officiating in Leafs-Bruins games in that the Bruins get away with EVERYTHING and they did get away with a decent amount of shenanigans tonight. A lot of it in the first two periods. I think what the Leafs got away with in the third period more than made up for it. So Bruins fans, I think where we can meet in the middle is that was a terribly officiated game. The stuff they let go was wild considering the stuff they called on both sides. But in this case it was the Leafs going on the power play, so who cares? They go to the power play! So what happens here is the Leafs have the puck in the corner, Mitch Marner, 
spins around on the backhand and just it's it's a bad pass when it happened live on the stream i thought nylander could have got to it he couldn't have he couldn't have watching it again there's no way so the crowd's sad the leafs got to regain the zone and willie goes back there and he retrieves the puck and i want you to pay close attention to these two screenshots right here is when william nylander not only has the puck but turns his head to look up the ice he is in his own zone he is moving slowly and methodically like just processing the ice surface like the Terminator. About one second later, right here, standing on his own blue line, is when he decides, all right, I'll do it myself. Nylander burns the Bruins wide in the neutral zone, burns the Bruins wide in the defensive zone, flies around the net, and here's how impressive William Nylander looked once again, that is Austin Matthews. That's Nosek in front of the Bruins net, standing right next to Austin Matthews. And at the point where Matthews actually touches the puck to whack it into the wide open net, Nosek just almost gets his stick on Matthews' stick. Oh, Matthews is just so quick. Darn, there's there's nothing Nosek could have done. That's why I took a screenshot of Nylander's pass to Matthews mid pass. And you can sort of see Nosek start to realize like, oh, I should be covering that guy, <laughs> but it's already too late. You can call it bad defense, you can call it sloppy, you can call it whatever you want, but the two goals in this game and the goal against the Flyers, Matthews did what the best goal scorers in the game do, and that's disappear, per per make you think they don't exist. And that put the Leafs up 2-1 on the power play, and it ended up being the game winning goal. You all saw what happened. Second intermission, you're feeling good. Second straight period where the Leafs have gone into intermission with the lead. Third period starts and there's Eric Shelgren and Eric Shelgren. What is Eric Sh what? And all of a sudden the Leafs third stringer is now maybe the first stringer? And the Leafs in the third period had a very obvious mission just crawl into a turtle shell and survive this thing. Now the Leafs played with way more speed and a way better transition game than they have for most of the season so far. And that took them to many places in this game. It helped them. But I remember during the stream, the shots were 4-2 for the Bruins with five minutes to go in the game. And it ended 7-2 for the Bruins in the third. Ignoring the two for a sec, because obviously that's bad and it's pretty bad when you're only protecting a one goal lead, but holding a team that is in first place, that is one of the most high octane teams in the entire league, who is losing the entire third period to seven shots in that third period is Herculean. Timothy Lilligren added a whole new dynamic to the Leafs roster, but it was everyone. Justin Hall had his moments. TJ Brody was doing his thing. Mark Giordano, how is he a Leaf? The clock winds down. Huge Selly from Shelgren, who doesn't even get the win because Samsonov was in net when the Leafs scored the game winning goal. Shelgren went into the game with the lead, didn't allow the Bruins to score, and that's why he wasn't given the win, which seems unfair, but you can't take it away from Samsonov and you can't give them two wins. So Ilya Samsonov remains undefeated on home ice this season, five and Oh, I don't know how that's possible or allowed. Which brings us to questions. What do we do for goaltending? Yeah, so about that, that thing uh, that I've been talking about for weeks has finally happened. Now at the time I'm shooting this, I don't know if Ilya Samsonov is even gonna accompany the Leafs to Carolina. Who knows, he might be fine. Shelgren was probably gonna get the start tomorrow on the second half of a back-to-back -back anyway and hopefully he just plays that game healthy and everything's fine. But if Samsonov is not well enough to even sit on the Leafs bench and be the backup, and let's be honest, if he's got an injury that's serious enough to pull him from a game, he should probably be staying behind in Toronto and working with the team's medical staff, which means someone should be accompanying the Leafs to Raleigh to be the backup to Eric Shelgren. But here's the problem that I've been talking about for weeks, the Leafs, didn't have a healthy goalie under NHL contract who wasn't on the Leafs. Matt Murray, obviously hurt. You go down to the Marlies. Joseph Wall is hurt and not back yet. They have guys like Dylan Ferguson and Keith Petrozelli and Dryden McKay, none of whom are under NHL contract. Until the afternoon of this game, the Leafs had the 50 roster spot maximum, meaning they couldn't sign anyone. They couldn't sign anyone to any amount of money regardless of the salary cap because they have 
the maximum amount of contract. It's a shame the Leafs lose Nikola Obey Kubel to waivers. It's a shame to ever lose anyone to waivers, but it was actually a blessing in disguise because it allowed the Leafs to free up a roster spot. So now if the Leafs have to sign a guy like a Petrozelli, they can. Like one of the questions I kept getting was, oh, do you really think Petrozelli's ready? This has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with, they literally don't have any other living, breathing human beings under NHL contract to play net. This has been the case for the Leafs for several weeks now. It's just they sort of were flying by the seat of their pants and got lucky up until this point. Like Samsonov's been great and also healthy and so is Shelgren. Even if Samsonov was fine and Shelgren was the one who got hurt, the issue would still remain. They would be short a goalie and they would be flying by the seat of their pants. So at the time I'm shooting this tomorrow, the Leafs goalies in Raleigh will be Eric Shelgren and Mystery Person and we are one injury away from Mystery Person being the Leafs starting goaltender. So what do they do? I don't think a trade is good. They're probably going to give up way too much. Remember they gave up a fifth for Michael Hutchinson? Oh, he was good back then. Go look at his numbers. No, he wasn't. And let's also remember whoever backs up Shelgren tomorrow, fingers crossed, but mathematically, oh, I'm afraid to even say it, mathematically, probably doesn't play. The standard for me isn't even good. It should just be professional goalie. Petrozelli is the name everyone keeps bringing up, but they have Dylan Ferguson, who has played some pro games on a tryout. He's been playing with the Marlies. I think it might be him actually. Can we get Reimer trending? Oh, I wish. And the one everyone wants to hear about. Honest question that I'd love to hear from you. Do you think the recent news really rattled this Bruins team? The way they played from puck drop, it seemed like they were gripping their sticks a bit tighter than normal and thinking too hard. Okay, so I agree with you for the most part. Thinking too hard on a few, obviously I told you how on both Matthews goals, it's Austin Matthews and you're not covering him. How come? And the deserved a win meter from moneypuck.com sure seemed to <laughs> indicate that the Leafs outplayed and kind of dominated the Boston Bruins. They outshot them, outpossessed them, out everything. Here's what I would say to that though. And it was a good Leaf win. Don't get me wrong. They played great in transition. Lilligren was a huge breath of fresh air for the team. The top six looked great. Bottom six starting to figure it out. D pairs look good. Like no one really looked bad. But even though your eyes can be dirty liars, I think the stats are a little misleading for this game and I don't think the Leafs dominated the Bruins as strongly as they suggest. I, they played great. They played great. Probably their best game of the season. But the grip in the sticks thing you said, the amount of times the Bruins were in wide open territory or one-timer territory, they didn't connect on one of them. Not one of them. They were fanning on it. Passes were going into feet. They were sailing right under and right over sticks. This is supposed to be the best and most crisp team in the National Hockey League. And yes, the best team in the NHL is going to have a few stinkers. They're going to have a few games where things don't go their way. The storyline writes itself. This looked like a team that was rattled. And don't leave a comment like about how this is unfair and all that and you're making this up. Dude, the Bruins themselves, here are their words. Mike Stevens quoting Nick Foligno on the player's reaction to signing of Mitchell Miller. I don't think any guy was too happy. <laughs> Nick Foligno from Fluto Shinzawa on the Mitchell Miller signing. It's hard for us to swallow. Hard for us to swallow? I don't, I don't think anyone was too happy. When have you ever heard an NHL player or anyone ever say that about someone who was just signed to their team? I don't remember anyone saying that about like Callie Yarncroak. Ah, uh, it's just, you know, it's hard to swallow, you know, four years. Another one, Arpin Basu quoting Fluto Shinzawa. I don't think Bergeron's happy, obviously. None of us are really with the situation. At the same token, it's the reality that we're faced with whether we wanted it or not. That's a funeral march of a quote. Even Bergeron himself. I'm not even gonna bother quoting him. Go look at the Elliot Friedman interview that he did with him. Some people weren't happy with Bergeron that he didn't like, he wasn't hard enough on him. Dude, you gotta remember the hockey grading curve. Like, like that is damning. Bruins management took the hockey team with the most immaculate vibes in the entire league and ruined it in one minute. And I hope I don't need to say this, but that's not even the worst reason to make that signing. So 
It's Saturday. This video is already too long. We got a podcast on Monday. We'll be able to get into more minutia. We'll be able to get into more of the details as they come out. Like apparently this guy might not even be eligible to play in the AHL or NHL despite the fact that he's under contract and what if the Bruins have to buy him out and then they're going to give him like over $600,000 for nothing. What a mess. What an unholy mess. What an unforced error by a team that prior to yesterday had done nothing but win for now that is it for this one thank you very much for watching click like if you like this video click subscribe if you really liked it tell all your friends once again link in the description link in the pinned comment we got uh the raffle for my dangle 10 jersey if you make a five dollar donation or more to my easter seals page easter seals is a charity that helps out kids with physical disabilities you'll be entered into the raffle to win my dangle 10 jersey i'll sign it i'll do whatever you want all you got to do to enter the raffle five dollars canadian minimum you got to reply to the tweet that is also linked there and what was the other one? Oh, you got to submit it by november 8th at noon yeah, this video was too long, but um, I, I think Bruins fans would agree this, the last 36 hours has been a little too long. <laughs> Hilariously, just as I was about to send this footage to Drew, uh, apparently the Leafs signed Keith Petruzzelli, and I used the word apparently because that's the word Elliot Friedman used, which makes it sound like he's not 100% sure, but the Leafs got Keith Petruzzelli. There you go. Worth noting, like Elliot pointed out, is the tweet here somewhere? Worth noting that uh, he's 6-0 and with the Marlies this year. So you might be a little skeptical because he had the one bad preseason game. It's one bad preseason game. This guy's a pretty good goalie. So there you go. I think this NHL promotion was inevitably going to happen for Petrozelli. He's in the organization anyway. They have the SPC spot. It's kind of necessary. I don't think this is the worst decision. I like it.